Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and April is Animal, Animal Cruelty Prevention Month. So today we'll be discussing why humans hurt animals intentionally, unintentionally, and how to prevent it with special guests. Ken Altine, Chief Executive Officer of the Sacramento Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Alexis Pagolatos, Chief Executive Officer of the Animal Rescue League of Berks County in Pennsylvania. And Bill Gadley, Vice President and Chief of Humane Law Enforcement of the San Diego Humane Society. So thank you all for being here, Ken, Alexis, uh, Bill. It's wonderful to be talking about this, this topic. And let's sort of go around uh, the room here and just talk a little bit about uh, what you do. We live close to animals. We love them. We sometimes work with them. And sometimes we also neglect them. It's a really big issue. And it also affects people of different levels of wealth uh, differently because uh, means connect to, to uh, uh, treatment, particularly medical treatment. So let's, let's go around the room. Let's start with you, Ken. Give us the, uh, the uh, 30,000 foot view of, of the state of our situation. Now, where we are in COVID, where everybody has gotten pets, right? You've had this huge influx. How do you see the situation in your region? Well, I think that we're fighting two things. One, a lot of people acquired pets. Many of them came from shelters. Many of them didn't come from shelters because so many shelters were closed. Um, and many of the pets they required were unaltered because they didn't come out of shelters where they get altered. So we are seeing sort of explosion of puppies in a way we hadn't seen in a while. But what we're really seeing is this, this, this mass increase of pet ownership, first time pet owners, pet owners who added two or three animals intersecting with the sort of veterinary crisis, which is a lack of veterinarians and a predicted shortage of veterinarians that will only get worse in the next eight years. How did this happen, uh, Ken, I, that we have such a shortage of veterinarians? But, I mean, it's a long pipeline. And, and all of a sudden, we, we have a supply that does not meet demand. How did this happen? Was that because of the, the acquisition of so many puppies and, and the increase in demand for veterinary services? No. Um, so we were sort of signaling, signaling um, you know, warnings back in 2018, 2019, based on some surveys uh, done by the uh, California uh, Veterinary Medical Association that predicted a shortage. It is a combination of vets coming out in exceedingly high debt, um, a really high um, uh, sort of dropout rate, if you will. People get into veterinary medicine five, six years into it, they're completely burned out and they get out of veterinary medicine. Uh, coupled with uh, a large um, movement to sort of uh, sort of corporate veterinary medicine. You know, uh, we have corporations that built up Mars M&M. You know, people don't realize it makes way more money from the pet industry than they do from the candy industry. It's so fascinating. You're, you're, you're drawing connections across all of society. Alexis, when we were talking um, before the show started, you were, you were talking about the connection between how a, a, a pet's condition is uh, reflective of how the owner is, is living. And you're, you're drawing all these different connections in your work over at, um, at, uh, in Berks County uh, talk about how you see it from a 30,000 uh, foot view. And then, uh, Bill, it would be great to have you weigh in. Yeah, I echo um, a lot of what Ken was um, was talking about. And, you know, he, here at the Animal Rescue League in Pennsylvania, we have seen, um, we've got a very diverse population here. Um, and one of the things that is really became crystallized during covid was as people kind of entered stages of their lives um, where they were more vulnerable, uh, vulnerable pets are not far behind. And so we talk about a great deal, you know, as an industry now about human animal support services. We don't just help pets anymore. We help animals. I mean, we don't just help animals anymore. We help people too, just as much frequently. Um, and one of the things we kind of encounter often is not that people don't necessarily want to do the right thing, but they may not have access to resources or even education on what exactly the right thing is or how to go about gaining access to resources. And we see a very um, concerning divide between, you know, there's a lot of disparity out there. And uh, when we make 
resources accessible when we can find grant grants and funding to do that, to make that accessible to people, they want to do the right thing by their pets. And they come forward in droves to try and, you know, get vaccinated and spayed and neutered and, you know, get vet care. I think it's just an enormous challenge for shelters because we have very limited funds. Our funding sources are lean. They typically um, are not tax funded uh, unless they're a municipal shelter. Um, And even then, uh, it's the sector is chronically underfunded and it shows, but we do the best we can. It's really part of a family need, isn't it, Bill? I mean, when when you look at what happens on the street, right, and either from the social work side or from the law enforcement side, those are two sides of one coin. Right. How do you see where you are? San Diego is way different than than Sacramento and real different than, than Berks County. How do you see the situation uh, uh, in, in the San Diego region? Well, you know, I, I do, I echo both of uh, my colleagues' comments as well, but I, I definitely see it in like what Alexis is talking about, that human animal support services network approach. We, we're, where people are struggling, their pets are going to struggle as well. You know, and so we have, one of the issues we have is that while San Diego is, is a large city, the uh, public transportation for someone to get into the shelter with their animal, if they're going to seek services, whether it's a vaccination clinic or, um, you know, uh, licensing or anything, it's very difficult for them to get here. So what, one of the things we've tried to come up with is um, partnering or using uh, rideshare services and providing vouchers. So we're, we're exploring it now on the, on the humane law enforcement end where you know, we've had, I'm sure you've all faced it too. We have a, a, a higher amount of surrenders, people trying to come in. And our goal is to keep that animal with the person if we can help them. We, we want to do those things before they get to the point that they're bringing them into the shelter. But And, and it, it ties in hand in hand with, with cruelty and abuse and neglect. And, you know, what people don't realize is some of the things they're doing are, are good things for their companion animals. And so we hope to help educate people and bring them into the fold, I guess. The thing that really strikes me about all of this is that this is neither, this isn't a political philosophy. This is just observed uh, 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 situations on the street, right? I mean, when you're, when you, Alexis, are talking about the connection between human health and and animal health, or Bill, when you're, when you're talking about people just, you know, being in such despair that they surrender, you know, they want to surrender their their pets, but they don't have the, the money Right. And Ken, you talk about the fact that we don't have uh, veterinarians. And what we're actually talking about is this is this uh, sort of connection. Um, and it's it, it's not a political thing, is it? I mean, none of you care about, you know, who donates a puppy or, or takes a puppy in terms of you, you don't ask for that party registration. Right. We don't even ask for the, for their you know geographic location. We're just like, I, I think one of the, the 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 common themes we're really seeing here is that our communities need to better understand that we are community organizations, not animal organizations. Animal is in our name and it's a historic thing, but actually, without people, we're sanctuaries, right? So, so if, if we can better to make your human we, services, we are human services, right? Because I consider, you know, you know, our responsibility to pets and our and our need for pets in our lives is quintessential to the human experience, right? So we are human organizations, we are community organizations, but far too many people see us as as the sort of punishment organization or or, or the organization you only use if you want to get rid of an animal or get an animal, and 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 all of us have worked for years to really broaden the scope of what we do to, to help animals and the people who love them. But I don't think everyone understands that. It, it's a messaging, it's always messaging, right? So let's talk about some of those programs. Uh, let's, let's talk uh, first about the whole idea of trying to reduce the, the, uh, the number of people who have uh, uh, pets giving birth to pets, giving birth to pets, giving birth to pets. Um, and let's just just go around the room. Every, every, uh, we'll we'll go around, and each person can talk about one program. Alexis, you want to talk about uh, those programs, or do you want to choose another one? Sure, sure. Um, generally, generally speaking, spay and neuter is um, very central to a lot of our operations and animal sheltering because we know 
Um, we've made so much progress with that over the last several decades. Um, and it's incredibly important, not only for the health of the animal, but for health of the overall animal population and the, the, the societal systems that support these, these animals. Um, we know back in the 60s and the 70s, um, we had exponentially more overpopulation challenges than we do now in certain parts of the country, but other parts of the country are still really struggling. Um, and so that's where you also see, you know, transport, transporting happen around, around our country to try and help um, distribute animals better. Uh, but so generally those, speaking, those spay and neuter, neuter programs, uh, Bill, do you want to take the, take Alexis's prompt on the distribution um, of animals and adoption and so on and so forth and talk about those programs? Well, sure. I'm from the, uh, originally from the Northeast and I can tell you in Massachusetts and mm -hmm. Hampshire, they're starving for animals or for dogs. You know, they, if they could get a, a, a shipment in of, uh, from an area that's inundated, they're gone so quickly. And I look at it and say, oh, I wish we could send dogs all the way across the country and help them. We do, we do our best. We, we kind of work with our partners in this area where I know we're taking uh, an intake today from one of the uh, areas further into the, uh, uh, into the Western part of the county. Um, but I just, just want to mention on those uh, spay and neuter, our goal when we go in, we just did it yesterday. We, we took uh, 11 animals into care from a, a one bedroom apartment. <laughs> An officer has been working with that person and um, five of those he surrendered and we'll work with a rescue and try to exit those dogs out through a rescue. And six, we're going to uh, you know, neuter or return to the owner after being spayed or neutered and work with that person about the, the uh, sanitation and everything else. So, I mean, our goal, and that's just pivot on you, but our goal is to try to keep animals from coming into the shelter. We, we want to put ourselves out of business, right? We, when people want to rehome their animal or surrender, we're talking about giving them alternatives. There are great websites that they can do it and, and tap into the power of social media where people will help each other, neighbors helping each other. But there's still that mindset. People say, oh, no, bring it to the shelter. And we're like, no, 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 wait, there's another way to do it. So, um, you know, um, you know, when I've worked with law enforcement, the best uh, experiences that I've had have been people who take a very integrative approach um, and, and they're looking at solving problems. Sometimes they're enforcement problems. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, there are other ways to solve things that combine this. And that's what you're describing. You're, you're talking about enforcement issues, right? But then you segue, right? And your folks are basically problem solving. It's exactly the way uh, our first responders need to work in order to, to really uh, help us all have a better, uh, better civil society, Bill. Thank you for, for describing that. Thank you. Um, uh, Ken, you wanna take a particular program? You already talked about the uh, veterinary training. Right. Um, but we've got so much, right? Uh, we do of human beings and yeah and, and and to build off what bill was saying earlier you know my organization does 20,000 spay neuter surgeries a year 20,000 you know we were, we're one of the largest spay neuter providers in the United States <clears throat> and we're still booked out 3 to 4 months in advance and so it's not that people don't want to get their animals spay and neutered. We, we, we proved this. We, we expanded our capacity. We hired more vets. We built out more to try to get that wait time down. Because if you, if you say, yes, I'm ready to get my animal spay and neutered. I've got the money. I've got the car to get there. I've, and now you're telling me it's going to be in for us. Now you're looking at July. In July, I might not have the money. I might not have the, the car. I might have changed jobs or my job hours have changed. And I can no longer keep that appointment. So we absolutely see in every community um, uh, in Sacramento, there is a huge desire to do it. They simply cannot access it. Well, according to those numbers, though, if you do 20,000 20, spay and neuters, you're backed up by about five to 6,000. Yes. Uh, right. And, and that's a five to 6,000. That's, that's, a, that's a huge, huge backup, particularly when you think that in back of those are another uh, you know, X number of thousands of needs. You know, you might you might have a need out there that is um, th that never comes to the fore. Nobody ever makes an appointment, so you don't register the fact that that you're that you're that backed up. 
you could be backed up by 50%. And in that three to four month period, you had one dog that needed help. Now you might have a dog and seven puppies that need your help. So you're you needing all finding grown. the same thing as, as Ken. Yes. I think Absolutely. one of the clearest things that has evolved, particularly out of COVID, because there became access challenges for private veterinary practices. Mm-hmm. I think what we are starting to see is a shift where animal shelters are now starting to have feel the need, the requirement. We feel very pressured to respond to this community need that we see by building out these spay neuter programming um, programs that we, you know, not necessarily all of us felt we had the ability to do. And now we feel like we can't not fill that need. And I think it's kind of leading toward a future where animal shelters are really going to become a community resource, animal welfare community resource centers, where people can come and we will likely in the future be where the masses kind of come for vet care. Basic um, and so veterinary care. Exactly. Basic, the basic really care. So we're struggling to, to meet. Um, I think we're all struggling to grow to meet the community need. And we see mm-hmm. it and it feels pretty dire from our side. Um, yeah, so we're all trying years, to grow. Five years ago, we did not set out to be the largest health care provider for animals in Northern California. But now we are. We, we provide health care, whether it's spay neuter, whether it's uh, low or no cost vaccines. Uh, we do wellness um, uh, exams. We service 40,000 animals a year now at our you're one. An animal, you're an animal care co-op. Basically. We are an animal, we are an animal care organization. Right. And not, a, I mean, it's, it's, it's what we do. I mean, we, we have 12 vets on and, you know, six RVTs and, you know, full service clinics and we cannot meet the demand. And it used to, the, the old thought 10 years ago was be careful about opening up a spay neuter clinic or doing any type of services for, for veterinary care because you're going to anger the veterinary community, right? That was the old thought. And now the vet, <laughs> person, can you take this case? Can you, we have vets sending us cases because they cannot meet the demand. Amazing, amazing. Uh, Bill, we just did uh, two polls. One was uh, how many people have witnessed um, the uh, um, animal abuse. And interesting, uh, 80% of the people said that they had witnessed. Reporting is more 50-50. Um, people are reluctant sometimes to report. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about the workflow that, that you encounter, How um, what your intake is, what your intake process is, and then how you pursue prioritize cases and, and get to resolution. And then also in the aftermath of resolution, because it's a it's a workflow that extends beyond. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't, those statistics, I, I, I figured there would be just about that. You know, people see a lot of, you know, there are a lot of things that happen in the community. You see, oftentimes you'll see people being rough with their dog or, or as they're out walking, sometimes, you know, striking them. And so we'll, we'll get those calls. We have to prioritize our responses. Um, we, we, you know, one through five, anything that's a emergent, you know, issue active animal cruelty um, or dog that's say attacking or animal that's hit by car, you know, that's where our officers are going immediately. Um, so one of the things we, I think one issue is people don't want to, they don't want people to know that they called, right? And so what we tell people is we don't disclose the, that information, but if we're prompted to by the court or, you know, if it goes to something, we, we, we do our best to keep that, those, uh, the names out of it. And we, we do, we do a pretty good job. Um, but you know, one of a lot of the things I think are people who don't actually, they, they think they're seeing cruelty, but it doesn't quite meet the, the definition of the law. Um, but they're concerned and we want them to call us. So we encourage that, but our, you know, like our dispatch center is now 24 hours. We, we handle probably a hundred calls per, per day during the daytime. Um, our offices have responded, I think last year, over 20,000 calls for service. Um, we cover a pretty large area here down in the San Diego, greater San Diego uh, area. Um, but what, when someone makes an act, if there's a, in a case that an officer is investigating and there is a, um, they develop information that results in that a, you know, a felony or a misdemeanor has been committed, they, they'll put the case together and they'll submit it to either the city attorney's office if it's a misdemeanor or our, our we have partnerships with the district attorney's office in felony cases 
but we we work so closely with them and we're aligned. We have a, a task force, an animal cruelty task force. We're, we're not looking to hit with a big stick. You know, like if 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 we can educate and talked about that diversion, our goal is to return animals to owners if they're capable of handling, uh, caring for them properly. California law states that very clearly. Uh, we, we, can, we can return animals to people if we feel they can properly care for them. If we feel they, do, they can't, then we don't, but more often we do, so. The, in the integration of, of, of uh, an enforcement, sort of an investigation and enforcement side and then it sort of turns into an education piece because you're, you're you're educating from the first contact, right? I mean, if you're if you got a report on me, right, and your officers came from the first contact, you're educating me in terms of you're 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 trying to do an investigation, but you're not trying to uh, take my dogs away. You're trying to ensure that my dogs stay healthy and happy and with me, right? Then we turn that not great home mm -hmm. into an okay home. Can we turn that okay home into a good home, right? How do, how do we improve, improve the situation where the animal is? Um, you know, because if, if you assume good intent, these animals aren't hated in their home. They may not be as loved as my dogs are or your, or your cat is, but they're part of a family. And if we can really help that family improve if we can give them watering bowls, if we can give them leashes and collars. You know, one of the things we try to do is when we see someone with one of those prong pinch collars is, can we give you a Cincy harness? Can we give you a better way to solve the problem? We understand the problem. It's a strong dog and it pulls, but that's a cruel way to, uh, can, can we, instead of just shaking our fingers, can we get you this free harness and trade you that? Can we just trade you that? And now you're controlling that behavior of the dog in the way that's better for you and better for the dog. Are you basically saying, Ken and, and Alexis, um, uh, it would be great for you to have you jump in, is that what we really need to do as, as like people, like Americans, sort of figure out the perspective of the other person, right? And if, if, if they're having a problem and it, you know, it goes to Bill or whatever, they're just having a problem. Right. It's, it doesn't mean that they're instantly evil or need to be treated with disrespect or, or any of that. Now, it doesn't mean that that's not a bleeding hurt, heart thing. It's like, just treat me the way I'd like to, to be treated. And, you know, I'll treat you the way you'd like to be treated. Isn't that what, what you're talking about, Ken? Yeah. I mean, the police learned long, a long time ago, if you're pulling over somebody for any violation and, and there's, a, there's an infant in somebody's lab, the best solution is to find them a car seat, right? Not, not find them, not punish them, not say, you know, don't do this. You're going to have to walk home with this child now because we can't let, find them a car seat. Solve, solve, solve the obstacle. Of the problem. Identify the obstacle that's preventing them from doing what you want them to do. You know, we just asked a, a, a question, Alexis. We said, uh, what are the biggest reasons people sometimes fail to properly care for their pets? Um, so we have um, a number yeah. of um, answers. What's your answer? What is the well? The kind of along those same lines. It, a lot of times we've got cultural differences and and norms that you know um, you know of how an, family animals you know live compared to other folks. A lot of times it's kind of the uh, we try and educate and provide resources, and then sometimes when that fails, that's where enforcement begins. I think there's a big challenge there sometimes of trying to help neighbors, especially understand that they can catch more flies with honey. So if they see, for example, inappropriate shelter outside for their next door neighbor's pet, maybe make some friends and maybe offer to buy a new shelter or, um, hey, do you want, do you, you know, I'm going to take my dog for a walk. You want me to take your dog for a walk um, with mine? You know, just trying to be neighborly instead of kind of, uh, assuming the worst of your neighbor, kind of, you know, try and try and embrace kind of that neighborly kind of uh, spirit to try and deal with this as like it, sometimes it kind of takes a village. And then, you know, we do supply some resources like like Ken was talking about. Um, sometimes if people are really struggling and they're, you know, they're they're at their wits end with how their dog's behaving, we can provide um, dog training scholarships. Uh, that's a program we have here to try and help people get the tools that they need to get to a better place uh, yeah, with their dogs. Collars, food, yep. training, 
you know, 100%. water bowls, you know, how's it, what is it they need? You know, sometimes I think when it comes to the reporting issue is our view of what is awful differs from other people. And, and, and Bill, you said something earlier that really resonated with me. You want, you want to talk about that? Yeah, it was a term that uh, another animal control officer had uh, mentioned to me in, in a chat on uh, Nextdoor, they, the, the social media site. And uh, she said, you know, awful, but lawful. You know, we may not like what we see. We It may not be what we as um, people who love animals and our way of knowing that would treat um, animals that, a certain way, but it's not illegal. And, it, you know, food, water, shelter is, is mm -hmm. a mantra in California. And um, but, you know, it, again, I think you said it, Mark, too, at the beginning, we were talking about COVID and the effect of COVID on everything. People pulled back, people sheltered in place, closed the doors and we, we can't go out. we got to stay six feet away. And, and now we're coming back out. And I think we're, 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 it's a challenge. And Alexis said it, you know, being neighborly, understanding who your neighbors are and what what is important to them and just opening lines of communication. And I think that. Barking dog complaints. I'm, I'm telling you, I don't know if you if either of you have an investigation of those. Thankfully, in the city of San Diego, we don't have to cover that, but we do cover it for the 13 other cities that we handle. And I go back to, you know, is that a real big deal, a barking dog? Well, if you're trying to work at home or you have a baby who's trying to sleep and someone's not addressing that, it's miserable, you know? So we what we do is we send a letter out and, say, and with ideas of trying to make, you know, um, corrections and things. So we're trying to give them an opportunity. And eventually, if it continues, we might go out and do a welfare check to make sure the animals aren't being treated improperly. But it's all about just trying to be good neighbors. And you know, I went to a dinner last night. It was the, um, the seventh annual IFTAR dinner, the law enforcement IFTAR dinner in San Diego. And it was the um, for Ramadan. And the message from everyone at that uh, dinner was just that we're all the same, really, you know. And so if we can all just talk, we can we can be a better society. So the same thing with our animals. So really, really inspiring, Bill. Um, one of the things that that uh, I'd love for you all to, co to comment about is that you know, I've been doing human services for for uh, much of my career in and out. And, and it's been in, at Children and Family Services. And, and of course, now we, we do a lot of work with all sorts of different organizations. My daughter lives in Oakland, in downtown Oakland, near a homeless encampment. Um, there are uh, animals in the, in the encampment. Um, one of the things that I noticed is that it, it's very, it's incredibly disciplined. The setting is not a setting that I'm living in, but if you take the setting away, uh, and you look at the caring that goes on, you, you sort of see this, the, the whole range of different behaviors, right? And then down the street, there are a number of, of fenced and small uh, homes uh, with, with dogs that are obviously guard dogs. And they, they, make, they, they, they function as dogs, they, they behave as guard dogs. But one of the things that I've noticed is that there are about four or five different homes like that. The entire neighborhood is looking out after the dogs. Right. And the dogs are part of the neighborhood. Right. And, and they recognize people. How do you you see it uh, in terms of what what you see on on the street in terms of people in different uh, circumstances? And and um, is there a problem that that has to do with homelessness or is it a problem that really is that those people can't necessarily care for the dogs in terms of veterinary care? And what's the issue? Is it attitudinal or is it means? Yes, to all of the above. Right. And, and and we have a question from Carol Walton saying, what about when you see a homeless person on the street with a pet and and, and what's way the best way to help this pet? Um, so so the challenges in the homeless or the unhoused community, uh, uh, one is there's no access, uh, but often those animals are, are adequately fed and watered. Um, they're a companion. Um, and they're highly socialized if they're in the camp. If, right. if, if you've got an out of control dog, the rest, the rest of the people in that camp will not That's tolerate awesome. that. They, they, they will sort of self-regulate it, uh, uh, if you will. The challenge becomes as we work with the um, providers of services to transition people into some type of housing is the animal is the first barrier. 
the first <coughs> very we see it uh, in California. We see it in in fire disaster. Right, people are fleeing their home of every economic social mm-hmm. background, and they can't enter any type of emergency housing because they have pets. So it's it's the same challenge regardless of whether you have money or not. But when you're in unhoused. Um, those agencies that say, yes, we allow your pet, but it's got to be vaccinated. It's got to be um, uh, have rabies certificate. It's got to be it's got to be it's got to be all these things that you don't have access to. So they immediately throw up that barrier. So I'm not going to leave my pet. And I'm, I'm my my options are very limited because I have this animal companion because I'm a human being. Lexus, we're going to give you a word and then, Bill, you're going to have the last word. If, if you were to think of one thing that we could all do, either on a, on a governmental regional uh, level or uh, that you could do, um, what would that be to make the situation better? Well, you know, when I, when I look at systemic challenges that we face as a society, as it relates to animal welfare, one of the things that I think um, people misunderstand and, and we're, we're trying to shift our model, animal shelters became, were, were historically reactive and now we're trying to be very proactive. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest challenges that I think we see across this country is the challenge of housing insecurity. Pet friendly, affordable housing is is actually would would if we could fix that problem where we have our communities have access to affordable pet friendly housing without barriers. That would open about ten and a half million slots for pets to move in with their owners into affordable pet friendly housing. And currently we, we, within, you know, if you just look at euthanasia numbers alone in animal shelters in the United States, we're about, uh, about, you know, one and a half million animals get euthanized each year um, in animal shelters. And a, a large portion of those are, you know, in areas where they're euthanized because of space challenges at shelters. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we could address some housing insecurity challenges, it's not that necessarily we have pet overpopulation, We have distribution challenges of where pets are in our country and housing insecurity challenges that make it very challenging for people to move and live with their pets. And if we could move a needle, it would transform our shelter situation across this nation. It's such a great point, uh, Alexis. Bill, uh, take us out. What is the thing that we should all do tomorrow? Oh, well, I will say this. Our community engagement team goes out and works in the schools. And that's what we need to get to the kids and talk to them about, you know, what what is a, a, a proper way to handle an animal and, and how to approach and and what what we should be doing. But I agree with Alexis, the housing issue is is number one. But if we can help teach our children about animals, they, they in a lot of the communities that we serve, they can help teach their parents. I learn from my kids all the time. They, they're they giving me all the lessons about what's happening in the world right now. So it's a two-way street, but let's get to the kids and talk with them. And my solution is free spay and neuter clinics in every major metro in the United States. The reason is, is because the net is, is financially beneficial, right? Absolutely. There you go. We just we, we've just saved a boatload of money. All we have to do is is help figure that uh, that out. Ken Altin, a chief executive officer of the Sacramento Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Alexis Pagalatos, chief executive officer of the Animal Rescue League of Berks County in Pennsylvania, and Bill Ganley, vice president and chief of humane law enforcement of the San Diego Humane Society. Thank you so much. This has been just a fantastic uh, conversation, and I really love the fact that that you are presenting the, the, the truth about these organizations that they're integrated into, into our society, into the quality of our lives and our communities, into human services. It, it's, it's about animals, but it's also about humans. Thank you so much. Thank your staffs, boards, donors. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.